Hi guys, it's Kathy. I hope you're doing well. So we're going to do um, Kelly trial day 6 a.m. today. There was no Kelly trial day 5 p.m. Though I told you that, but I don't know. There's probably lots of people who didn't see that. Doesn't know that. Is looking for day 5 p.m. That's okay. They can look. They can look. Maybe they'll find some other cool videos. Right? So, just a quick summary. Um, me and his wife bought a piece of property right by the Mexican-American border. And um, while they were in their home one day, they saw um, a bunch of illegal Im Im immigrants walking through their yard about 160 feet away. And... Um, Mr. Kelly thought they were they were drug drug mules, and he says that he fired a warning shot from his AR style rifle up into the air, um, and they scattered. Um, Border Patrol came, and they sort of searched the area. They didn't find anything. But later on that day, Mr. Kelly found a body, so now he's on trial for murder and um we're up to day six i don't know what they have planned for day six they didn't tell us in advance so we're gonna watch this together here we go oh great thank you everyone please have a seat all right we're on the record in uh state versus kelly cr 2023 026 your Honor, we had some scheduling challenges this morning. One of our witnesses flying in from out of town, her flight got delayed, so we were having to change up the schedule. Just wanted to let the court know. Yeah, thank you. I just, and I, I knew that. I was aware of it, but thank you anyway. I thought we'd use a little time to discuss one issue <coughs> um, since we're going to wait for a witness. Are we waiting for that witness, or do you have another? No, Judge, we have another witness. We're ready to go. Um, oh, okay. We do, we do have a stipulation with respect to that witness that's coming in later this morning and with respect to the... Um, the medical examiner is coming in later as well. Do you want to? Do you have a stipulation for your next first witness? Or no, that's just cross on Castaneda. We're calling Castaneda to complete the cross examination. Okay. Well, him. then, um, where does it go? He's probably. Hmm? Yeah, we can bring in the jury. What I, what we'll talk about? We won't talk about it now. I thought we had time, but not a big deal. Uh, I want to find out from you where are we on um, your agreed uh, motion for the viewing of the crime scene. So we're going to bring the jury in now, but. Uh, we're still working on that, Judge. We've kind of got the logistics, I think, agreed upon. The state is still objecting to viewing of the end of the wall. So we would just need a decision from the court on whether the view can include the end of the wall. But other than that, we've essentially agreed to put some markers out at different places on the property of things that we would like to view. Very cool. They're taking the jury over to Kelly's property. That's really cool. I highly, 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 highly doubt it's going to be on camera, but we'll see. And to have um, a detective just walk the jury from one to the other. And Your Honor, we do have some concerns because I believe there's like some kind of memorial where the victim passed away that would be completely inappropriate for the jury to see. And so I've expressed okay. some concerns about that based on photographs I saw from Dr. Martinelli. If that's not what I'm seeing in those photos, if there's not some sort of memorial on the property, then that's not an issue. But I can't tell from the photos and we would like to go look at it before we agree to it. All right. I just want to get some read on where we were on this. But. Yeah, and there's there's no memorial. I, I don't know what that is. All right. So, I mean, that's going to take a little bit of planning. That's why I'm raising the issue now. Um, but we have more time. We'll discuss it further. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, perhaps we could do that on Monday. Uh, Monday morning. That's what I was thinking, Judge. That way we could um, have it. We would know before. We want to do it before the close of the state's case. All right. Um, but we anticipate we may, because of delays, we're thinking probably next Tuesday, our last witness. Ready? Uh, are they coming in? Good. We'll talk about that. Or 
Okay, what was that? What was the noise? What so what is that? I'm, I'm guessing it's an exhibit. Taking them to the crime scene, would you classify that as an exhibit? Um, what do you call that? What do you call that in court when you take them to the crime scene? What was that whistling noise? What? Was it sabotage? We'll look at that uh, Monday. Would that work for the defense if I could figure that out? Set that up for Monday. Monday's not a good day for the defense. We had suggested Tuesday. Um, that was the viewing that Tuesday. What right. she suggested. She's talking about previewing it. Oh, I was talking about discussing it further in court. <laughs> okay. But uh, the other thing we have to discuss is it, this, this would have to happen at the close of all the evidence. So we would need some non committal uh, estimate of, of what the. Um, of how long the defense case would take. So. All right, good morning, everyone. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendants, and we're back on the record uh, in State versus Kelly, and the state can call its next witness. Governor, the state is recalling Officer or Deputy Castaneda to the stand. I believe we were in the defense's cross-examination when we took the break for the experts last week. All right, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, please. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this, but just for the record, you're still under oath. You understand? You're still under oath, right? Yes. Good. All right. Um, the defense can continue with its cross-examination. Thank you. So just to recap, um, we were talking about this last time, but you arrived at the property. Border Patrol was already there. They were doing some preliminary searching, and you and other deputies did some searching of this property, Correct. Correct. Do you recall seeing Border Patrol do a perimeter search of the house? Do you remember that? I recall them being there. And you don't know where exactly they were in relation to the house no. when you arrived? No. Okay. So when you searched this area, describe for me why you searched the area that you searched. Because the information provided to us was that uh, Mr. Kelly had a uh, walked outside his house and, and started following us, the uh, subjects that he had seen carrying, uh, possibly carrying weapons and, and backpacks. And the area that you searched, did you search it because that's where these subjects had supposedly been seen? Can you repeat that, that question? Real quick? Yes, the, the particular area that you searched with the other, it was three other deputies, right? Correct. Was that an area that you searched because that is where Mr. Kelly had been seen or where these subjects had been seen? I don't exactly rec recall why we started in, in the area with, where we started. Okay. Do you know who who has that information? Which deputy? No. Okay, but one of you in that group of four had some information that we need to search this general area, right? Yes. And I think the state showed you a picture of a map. I'm going to show you some drone footage. Can we put this up? It's already been admitted. This is State's Exhibit 36. And I'm just going to play the footage for you. It goes from the patio on the east side of the house out over the desert area. And then it sort of turns around so you have a view looking back at the house. And when it gets to that view, I'm going to pause it, and you can tell me if you can show me on there where you guys all fanned out, okay? Okay. I really wish we could see this. Ah. 
Oh, I was trying to pause it. <laughs> Let me go back or forward. And if you see a spot that looks like something that you can recognize that would be helpful, you can tell me to pause it there. Okay, I'm gonna pause right there. Is that a helpful view for you to be able to describe where it was that you guys searched approximately? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yes. And you mentioned you went over the first fence on two ladders. Can you show us where those were? Do you know how to mark on there on the screen? Uh, yes. I, I'm not able to see the, the, the ladders, but they were somewhere close to this. Uh, close to the pump house? Yes, close to that. So I see the big house, and then to the right, there's that little small structure, which is a pump house. And then if you go a little bit further to the right, I think you can see the horse right there. Are the ladders more or less in that area where the horse is? Yes. Okay. And can you just, do you know how to draw on the screen? Yes. Could you go ahead, just put a mark on there where the horse is to show where the ladders are? I'll see if I can get rid of this thing on the bottom. I can't. Oh, well. Okay. There we go. So that's where you all crossed over the first fence, right? Correct. And then I think you said you were all sort of together going through to the second fence, Correct. right? And then can you show me where it is that you fanned out, if you can? I, I wouldn't be able to tell you from, from here. Does it need to back up a little further? Uh, probably, yes. Let me see if I can move it. OK. Well, maybe that's not helpful. OK. Can you just describe? In relation to the house, the search, my understanding is it's further away from the house than what's on this image. Is that right? Yes. Can you just describe in relation to the house at what line approximately you all were searching? So if we drew a line back to the house from where you guys were, what would those lines look like? Could you draw them for us? So you want me to draw from how we walked out to, to the fence line? Is that what you I want you to draw about? if you're already on the other side of the second fence, because that's when you fanned out, correct? Yes. Draw lines going back to the house from where all of you were fanning out. I know you didn't go back to the house, but I think that'll just give us an idea of how spread out you were and where you were in general. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. I'm just not really sure exactly where we started and, uh, to go towards uh, towards the ladder. I'm, I'm talking about after you get over the second fence and then you spread out. I'm just trying to get an idea of how far spread out, what the distribution was like. I, I'm not really sure how, like how I would be able to, I, I don't see the second fence line here. It's, Oops. Did you touch something? I did. <laughs> Hang on. I got... apologize. Oh, that might have been you. You can hit undo. Let's try that. There we go. Okay. So you can see the first fence line in this picture, right? Yes, I believe it's. Uh, you would... should I mark it? Yeah, just just put a point on there so we can see where the first fence line is. I believe the first fence line is this right here. Okay, and then the second fence line is down at sort of the bottom of this picture, right? Correct. And you guys did not search this area in between the fences, right? Correct. And you, why not? Why didn't you search that area? Because I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so you go over the second fence and you all spread out and search from there. Correct. How far apart were each of you when you were searching beyond the second fence? I couldn't tell you. Do you know what order you were in? Was somebody to your right and somebody to your left? Were you at the far end? How do you remember that? No, I was somewhere in the middle. Uh, I couldn't tell you the exact order. Okay. And then you just continued onward until you hit a wash. Is that right? Yes. 
And once you hit the wash, do you follow the wash to the right or to the south to hit a road? No, I kept uh, on walking south until I hit a third fence line. Did you cr south through the wash? I crossed the wash. I went onto the wash and then out. The okay, wash. so you continued going east, is what you're saying? At the time, I was that's I was heading south. Okay, and then you eventually hit a, another fence line somewhere. Yes. Do you know how far away that was from the house? No. Okay, and then you came back to the house. Is that correct? Yes. And that was because you had heard that the homeowner had been located? Correct. All right. And so how did you go back to the house? I walked back um, until I hit a, a dirt road. And that's where I met uh, Deputy Cabrera and Deputy Monreal. Okay. And just to be clear, when you were searching, you were carrying a rifle. Is that right? Yes. That was because of the nature of the call. That was dangerous, right? Yes. And you were looking for people who were potentially armed. Is that right? Correct. And you were looking for people who were maybe potentially hiding, right? Correct. And you were looking for people who might potentially be injured, right? Not at the time. Not, nope. You weren't looking for people who might be injured? Not at the time. Okay. But you were looking for people who might pose a threat? Correct. Okay. And then when you go back to the house, is the homeowner already there? Just describe to me going back to the house. Um, I walked back uh, to the dirt, uh, the dirt road where I met uh, Deputy Cabrera and Deputy Monreal, and Mr. Kelly was uh, present there. Um, and then I got on to the deputy's unit, and they gave me a ride back to the to the house. So you met up with Mr. Kelly out on the property somewhere. I, I saw him uh, out of the property. Yes. Okay. And then they, and then you went back to the house, and he went back walking, right? Correct. When you got back to the house, what did you do next at the house? I I talked to Ms. Wanda Kelly. Who else talked to Wanda Kelly when you were there? Uh, Sergeant Garcia. Okay, so both you and Sergeant Garcia were having a conversation with Wanda Kelly, is that right? Yes. Okay. And describe Mrs. Kelly's demeanor when she was having a conversation with you. She ap appeared to be confused. Uh, to me. Why do you say that? Um, it, it was just, uh, I don't know, the way she was answering when, when I would ask uh, a question. Did she seem distraught when you were speaking with her? Could you use a different word for it? Did she seem upset? Not really upset. Did she seem agitated? A little bit. Nervous? Yes. Shaken up, maybe? Yes. Okay. Do you remember how long you spoke to Mrs. Kelly at that time? No. Did you ask her? You didn't ask her to do a walkthrough of the scene or anything like that, correct? I don't recall, no. So you didn't ask her to say, show me where you were standing when you first saw people or anything like that, right? I don't recall asking that. And you didn't ask her, did you, you know, how far away were they? Which direction were they going? Show me precisely where you saw them. You didn't do anything like that with her, right? No. Okay. Do you remember, let me see if I can pull this up. Can we take that down, Valeria? I'd wanna make sure nothing pops up on the screen up there. Thanks. Both you and Deputy Garcia or Sergeant Garcia had this conversation with Mrs. Kelly, correct? Yes. And you documented this conversation in your report, correct? Yes. Presumably Deputy Garcia also documented this conversation in her report, right? I would assume so. And that's standard practice. Whenever you go out, everybody documents these kinds of things in their reports, right? Correct. And you and Deputy Garcia are having the same conversation with Mrs. Kelly, right? Yes. And so the reports that you both wrote should contain essentially the same statements. Is that correct? They should. Do you recall Mrs. Kelly telling you that she heard shots? Yes. And would it surprise you to learn, well, did you document that in your report, that Mrs. Kelly stated that she heard shots? Yes. And so 
Sergeant Garcia also should have documented that in her report, correct? She should have documented what she, what she heard. Would it surprise you to hear that Sergeant Garcia in her report documented that Mrs. Kelly stated she did not hear any shots? And she, she would have uh, documented what she, what she heard at the time. If she documented that Mrs. Kelly stated, I didn't hear any shots, Sergeant Garcia would be incorrect. Is that right? Again, she would have documented what she heard. And you would have documented what you heard, correct? Correct. And if you documented Mrs. Kelly said she heard shots, and if Sergeant Garcia documented... Mrs. Kelly said she didn't hear shots, then one of you is wrong. Is that right? Potentially. Unless Mrs. Kelly said both of those things, right? She could have said both things. And if she said both of those things, that would be pretty strange, right? Yes. And that's something that you would probably document in your report, right? I would have. If she said both of those things, right? Correct. But you didn't document that in your report, right? documented what I recalled hearing from her. And what you recall hearing from her is, I heard shots. This has been asked and answered, let's move on. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Took you long enough though. When you were speaking with Mrs. Kelly, you didn't record this interview, did you? No. And Sergeant Garcia obviously didn't record the interview either, correct? Not to my knowledge. And obviously, if there was a recording, then it could be cleared up exactly as to what was said, correct? Correct. Okay, but we don't have that in this case. No. And the same is true for Mr. Kelly, correct? Correct. So people spoke with Mr. Kelly, but nobody recorded his statements, right? Not on my end. Do you know if anybody recorded his statements? I'm not sure. And after speaking with Mr. and Mrs. Kelly, you get more of the story, is that correct? Yes. So you learn from just from these interviews that in general, they heard a shot or, or shots, right? Correct. And then they saw some people running with rifles and backpacks, correct? Possibly carrying rifles and backpacks. Right, and then after you received that information, nobody did any additional searching, is that right? Correct. Why didn't you do any additional searching? Uh, because at the time Mr. Kelly had been located, our main concern was uh, Mr. Kelly's safety and uh, not finding any subjects. Um, we assumed that the, the, the threat that we had responded to was, uh, was no longer there. But you were, you were getting information about a pretty serious crime, is that right? Yes. I mean, people carrying backpacks and rifles, that's a serious crime, right? Carrying a rifle is not a crime. If you're on trespassing on someone's property, that's a crime, right? Trespassing, yes. And if you're carrying a rifle while you're trespassing on someone's property, that makes it a bit more serious, right? Potentially, yes. And potentially dangerous, right? Yes. And if you're carrying backpacks that are highly suspicious, that's possibly indicative of a crime, correct? Not necessarily. Are you in a high drug trafficking area when you respond to Mr. Kelly's property? Um, high uh, uh, undocumented immigrant trafficking area. Drug trafficking also? Uh, in the six years that I've uh, worked for the sheriff's office, I haven't responded to a call and that involves uh, uh, drug dealing uh, in that area. You did on January 30th, didn't you? Uh, the call was in reference to uh, subjects running with carrying backpacks and rifles. With large backpacks and rifles, right? Correct. You put two and two together, that's possible drug trafficking, Objection, right? Objection, argumentative, Your Honor. You get this information about these crimes being committed on Mr. Kelly's property, and you get information about a shot being fired, correct? Correct. Shooting is on somebody's property without their permission is a crime, right? Correct shooting at another person is obviously a crime, right? Correct. And that could have been happening out there based on the information you received, right? Potentially, yes. And even after receiving that information, nobody thought to go do a more thorough search of this area, right? Not at the time. 
Nobody thought to possibly go look for the source of that single shot that Mr. Kelly reported, right? We did went out to search for, for the source uh, when we first arrived while we were looking for the subjects at Mr. Kelly. I'm talking about after Mr. Kelly tells you about that single shot and the subjects that he saw. You didn't go do a more thorough search after that? Not after the first search. And you're aware, obviously, that later in the day, a body was discovered, correct? Yes. And that body was discovered with a single gunshot wound, correct? Yes. And you later learned that that was in that general area that you folks had been searching, correct? In the general area, yes. And so now there's the question of, was this body there when we searched the area and did we just miss it, right? That's one possibility, right? <coughs> Potentially. Or was this body not there when we searched this area? That's another possibility, right? Potentially. And that's a question that we have that's unanswered, correct? Correct. And that question possibly could have been answered if after Mr. Kelly gave you information, you folks had gone out there and done a thorough search of that area, right? Yes. Then we would know for sure, right? Yes. But now we don't, right? Yes. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect. Deputy Castaneda, if Mr. Kelly had told you that he went out onto the patio and fired nine shots east towards people, or even if he told you he, fought, he shot them in the air, would you have done a more thorough search? Yes. Council asked you about uh, Ms. Kelly's statements to you uh, while you were out there that day. Is that right? Yes. And what specifically did Mrs. Kelly tell you about the shots that she heard? She told me that she heard shots. And what did you, what else did you document when she told you that she heard shots? Do you recall? No. If you looked at your report, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. They switched lawyers and you think for a second you're going to get away from the repetitive questions over and over again, the same thing, but it's just like out of the fire into the frying pan or the other way around. Have you refreshed your recollection? No, I wasn't sure. Oh, if I please was go right ahead. Please look at your report. Thank Could you repeat the question? Sure. What was it that Mrs. Kelly told you about the shots and what did you document? Uh, that she heard shots and that she appeared to be confused at the time. And what did you say in your report that she appeared to be confused about? Could I refresh? No. Yes, please. I apologize. She said that she was confused about, uh, I documented it, she appeared to be confused about what she heard. So she's confused about what she heard? Correct. As you're asking her about the gunshots? Correct. And did you, did you ask her <clears throat> if these individuals were carrying backpacks and rifles? Yes. And what did she say? Uh, she said that they were carrying rifles and I asked her if uh, all of them were, were carrying rifles. And how did she respond? She said no. She said not all of them were carrying rifles. Correct.
When you spoke to Mrs. Kelly, did she did she tell you who she heard shooting? No. Objection hearsay. Overruled. I mean, we've been hearing hearsay from this witness so from both sides. So um, objections overruled. So nothing in your report documents who she heard shooting the weapon. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. That's all I had, Your Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, jury, any questions from the jury for this witness? One question. Very well. Uh, jury's allowed to ask questions. So. Counsel. I'm, I still don't know if he's muted yet. We'll find out in a second. Did he say anything? He doesn't even have his headset on. Oh, he's trying. Yeah, he said something. He's muted. Oh, boy. All right, he has the jury question. Do, 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 do. All right. Uh, there's one word you wrote. I can't read. I can't read your writing as to one word. It's Deputy Castaneda something question mark. The question what? Can I already ask questions? Well, what's that word? Deputy, and then Deputy Castaneda. I can read the rest of it, but what's that one word? Deputy Castaneda, it looks like. Indicated that. Okay, got it. All right, thank you, sir. You could almost hear him, almost. All right, the question from the jurors, the juror is, um, Deputy Castaneda, Castaneda indicated that all were armed with rifles or some. So we're gonna to try to clarify this and answer this question through additional questioning from the parties and first the state. I'll give the question to the clerk. You may go, go ahead, Ms. Hall. First of all, Deputy, did you talk to Mr. Kelly about what he said that he observed that day? Yes. And this, did, what did Mr. Kelly tell you with respect to the subjects, the individuals that he saw, and whether the, or not they were carrying rifles? He advised me or he, he told me that uh, he observed them wearing backpacks and possibly carrying rifles. So his word to you was possibly? Correct. And then did you speak to Mrs. Kelly? Yes. And Mrs. Kelly um, also told you that she thought she observed rifles, is that right? Correct. And what did she see, say about when, when you asked her whether they were all carrying rifles, what was her response? She said no. I think that's all I had, Judge, thank you. Uh, Ms. Larkin? When you asked Mrs. Kelly, were they all carrying rifles, and she said no, she had previously stated that some of them certainly were carrying rifles, correct? Uh, she didn't mention certainly, she said that. But she said she saw rifles or a rifle, right? Correct. 
Okay. And just to be clear, neither of these conversations were recorded by anybody as far as you know, right? Correct. Asked and answered. I don't have anything else, Judge. All right. Any other questions for this witness from the jurors? Sir, uh, did that answer your question? Very good. All right. Thank you, uh, Officer Sergeant. Uh, you can step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And this can we discuss the scheduling? All right. State can call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Deputy Lopez. Good afternoon. I guess it's morning, isn't it? I don't even know what day it is. Sorry about that. Could you tell the jury, please, your full name and your occupation? My name is Rafael Lopez. Uh, I'm uh, currently a deputy sheriff at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been a police officer? Uh, 10 years. And have you spent all that time with the Sheriff's Department? I started in 20, 2009, October 2009, with the Sheriff's Department as a detention officer. Uh, spent two years at the detention center. Uh, I was uh, applied for a patrol division and I was accepted in 2011. Uh, I then uh, attended the academy and uh, the Solency Academy in Tucson, Arizona and graduated in uh, 2012. Uh, could you maybe pull the microphone a little closer to you? I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Maybe you could just pull it closer. Is that better? Yes, thank you. You're soft-spoken like me, so. <clears throat> could you tell us, um, you said you attended the academy. Is that the standard academy we've heard other officers talk about? Any un Anything unusual about your academy? It's a Solezzi Academy in Tucson, Arizona. It's a Southern Arizona uh, Law Enforcement Training Center. And how long is the academy? Uh, I stayed there for since... September 2011 till January of 27th, which is when I graduated in 2012. And you've been with the Sheriff's Department ever since? Yes. And were you on duty on January 30th of 2023? Yes, I was. And what were you doing that day, um, early in the day? I was working at the school uh, when I heard the, the, the call. And what were you doing at the school? Um, uh, I was a school resource officer. So at the time you were assigned as a school resource officer? At that time, yes. And what kind of call came out that would pull a school resource officer? Um, emergency call, alert tone. 
And alert tone, we, we heard about that earlier. That's when you hear a specific sound on the dispatch by dispatch? Yes, actually, um, since I'm assigned to the school, I'm, I'm supposed to stay there until the, the day ends, and it was around that time. So I did hear the, the call earlier. Once I was done with the uh, traffic and everything, um, I proceeded to the area as well, just to, uh, even though I knew already there were deputies at the scene, I just proceeded in case they needed uh, some backup or, or assistance. All right, so you finished up your school day and then you decided to head on out to the call, is that? Yes. Okay. So when you arrived, do you know how many other deputies were on scene? There were two, three, four. Do you know what time you arrived at the scene? I left uh, from school at 15.06 and arrived sometime 15.27, 15.28 hours. So close to 3.30 in the afternoon? Yes. When you got there, what's the first thing you observed when you arrived? I saw the patrol cars <coughs> uh, in the area, and uh, I went straight to one of them. Um, somebody, I think I heard over the radio that uh, they were looking for Mr. George Kelly, or a subject uh, with uh, two dogs and a rifle. So I went um, and approached one of the of the units, the patrol cars, uh, and that was uh, Sergeant Lluvia Garcia. And after you saw, uh, after you spoke with Sergeant Garcia, what did you observe next? Well, when I was uh, talking to her car to car, um, she mentioned that she could hear dogs and, and she pointed to, to the distance and, and then we saw that uh, there was uh, uh, two border patrols coming uh, and with a male subject, and he and she said it was it was it was probably him. So you saw two border patrol officers, and what were they doing? Were they walking? Were they in a vehicle? What, what they were, were they? walking with with Mr. Kelly. And you later identified him as Mr. Kelly. They did. Um, um, because he started, he he was walking towards the uh, patrol cars, and they and they said it was him. So I just remained there for a few minutes, and then I knew it was him because that was the reason I was there to kind of go search for him. Um, and uh, they said it was him. And what did you see of him when you were there? <clears throat> he was carrying a rifle, and his dogs were with him. And you see him here in the courtroom today? Yes. Okay. Could you describe what he's wearing for the court, please? Uh, he's wearing his uh, blue shirt and the uh, blue vest. Your Honor, could the record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant? So ordered. And after you knew that Mr. Kelly had been located and that was why you were there was to help locate him, what did you do next? Um, I just uh, went back. Uh, I I left the scene. And, uh, I think they remained there still uh, while I left. So you were there pretty briefly, it sounds like. Yeah, probably 10 minutes or less. Did you have some involvement in this case later in the day? Yes, I did. And can you tell us... Um, what started that involvement later in the day? Well, I was actually working uh, Operation Stone Garden. And could you explain what that is to the jury, please? It's a different assignment that we work uh, ourselves at, uh, after we're done with our patrol duties. Uh, we sign up for that. That's It's, it's usually overtime. It is overtime. So uh, what happens there is that this operation, uh, it's... Uh, working uh, alongside or or in conjunction with a uh, border patrol uh, to assist with uh, any illegal 
narcotics or, or immigrants coming in through the border. Uh, what happened that day, I came in at uh, uh, to work uh, Stone Garden at uh, 4 p.m. That's why I left the scene that day, so I could be on time to start the other assignment. Um, I started at 4 p.m., and then uh, it runs from 4 to 8 p.m. But uh, while I was um, working in Stone Garden, um, I was assigned to Duquesne uh, Road, which is uh, nearby where the incident had occurred earlier with Mr. Kelly. Um, so I took it upon myself to go check the the side uh, dirt roads that lead to the to the border. Um, and I was just in case I saw because they had mentioned there were um, subjects running uh, earlier, and I said, you know what, I'll check just in case there's somebody hiding or it's already past three hours or two hours since, since this occurred, they could now think that we're not here. We'll probably, if there's somebody walking in the area, I'll probably see them. So I went to the uh, Forest Service Road, which is a side uh, dirt road that leads to the, to, the, to the border. And I was there when I heard another, another call from dispatch. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what you're telling me. You you check out of the call at the Kelly residence and you check on to Stone Garden, but you decide you're going to go ahead and search the area because you're concerned. Because uh, they assigned me to that area, Duquesne, right. Duquesne, which is a, the road that passes through uh, Keno Springs Village uh, in Duquesne. It, okay. it leads to the to the um, that area the, near the ranch. And so you said you drove down a Forest Service road. And did I understand you to say the Forest Service road that goes to the border? Yeah, those Forest Service roads, uh, technically, they're dirt roads that, that interconnect and they lead to the border. Okay. If you follow them all the way, they lead to the, to the, and to the border wall or the fence. Did you see anything while you were looking in this area? No, I was looking, uh, and I didn't see anything, anybody in the area. And then I think you documented in your report that you were at Duquesne in a Forest Service road. Which Forest Service road was that? Uh, 4667. <clears throat> okay, and when you were at that Forest Service road in Duquesne, what's the next thing that happened? I heard of the, over the radio that... Uh, uh, dispatch uh, was saying that uh, Border Patrol had called uh, saying that uh, uh, to proceed again to the same area where we had gone before, which was uh, Mr. Kelly's uh, place, uh, and mentioned that he had struck something. And what time did this call come out? Around 1756. And what time is that in non-military time? Uh, like 5.56 p.m. And when you got this call, what did you do? Um, even though I was nearby, uh, I decided to go and assist the... Because the, this call was uh, given to the patrol uh, officers, whoever was in charge of uh, that uh, district, uh, but I decided to go myself as, as well, just to make sure everything was fine. I actually arrived before the, the patrol officer that was supposed to head over there. I, I arrived before him. Okay, so there, a, a patrol officer got deployed as well and you, because you're in the area, went ahead and responded. Because yeah, it was it was the the call was given to a patrol officer. All right. Uh, the sign one, I'm in the since it's too far from Eureka for them to make it all the way to the ranch, and I was nearby, I uh, proceeded myself as well. Was there something about the call that led you to be concerned before you arrived? Well, yes, because uh, earlier we. 
we had heard that there were shots fired and we didn't know if it was gonna something was going on again so that's why i decided to go and assist and when to, when you got there um at some point you were concerned enough that you did something what did you do when you arrived well actually i uh when i arrived to the gate i saw mr kelly coming towards the gate he was on the phone and uh, i decided to turn on my uh my recorder my issued recorder from the sheriff's office what caused you to do that well the reason was that we knew that that uh earlier the reports were that uh, shots were fired so i needed the information just to get it correct and did you document this recording uh, did you put that on, into evidence i did and when you put that into evidence what what item number did you mark it with uh item number one rl Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 38. Do you recognize that item? Yes. How do you recognize it? Because it's a copy of the CD that I uh, turned in for uh, for the recording that I uh, got that day. And how do you know that it's a copy of that recording? It says here, the, Lopez recording of Kelly. Did you review that recording and initial and date it on the back of the envelope? That was on uh, July 25th of, of 23, which was last year, when I uh, went and reviewed it and initialed it. And is that an accurate, accurate copy of the recording, of the recording you made of Mr. Kelly on January 30th of 2023? Yes. You're going to move for admission of State's Exhibit 38. No objection. Exhibit 38 is admitted. You're on a permission to publish. Permission granted. Do we need to dim the lights or? Your Honor, we, it's just an audio recording, oh. but I do have a stack of transcripts to hand out for everyone that I've provided to the JAA with the court's permission. Um, I guess for the record, I'd object on the best evidence rule. I, I think the just hearing the recording is better than the transcript. And Your Honor, I can lay the foundation for the transcript as well because the deputies observed well, is that it, as well. Is the audio difficult to hear? Or? It, it can be judged. Um, it, it's just for everyone's convenience and following along. There are some of it, it's kind of faded in and out, so you really have to listen. And it's all audio, it's not video. All right, you can uh, you can go ahead and, and distribute those to the jurors. But so members of the jury, you're going to get a, a transcript of whatever it is you're going to hear. The evidence is the recording itself. The transcript is not evidence. The transcript is just there to uh, it's not being admitted. So it's not going into evidence. The transcript is there to aid you if you want to try to understand what's being said on the recording. But if you hear something different on the recording from what's in the transcript, the recording is the evidence, not the transcript. It's kind of like another one of those, um, what I call demonstrative exhibits. And, and listen carefully, because uh, when you go back into the jury room to deliberate the case, the evidence will be recording and you won't have the transcript. So the objections overruled. Judge just what doesn't want to struggle to hear. <laughs> and just for the record, Deputy Lopez, did you also review the transcript um, that we're going to look at with this recording as well? Yes. And was it accurate? Uh, yes, uh, I did do a, a correction on, on which is on page. 
three, uh, four play. Um, on my report, it said he uh, if he shot him, and uh, on the recording, it says who shot him. I asked him who sh if but you who, said who shot him. That I made the, that that uh, correction. Okay. He for who? It should be he shot him, not no, who, who shot him. It should say who shot him. Yeah, it's on page three. Okay. So the correction's been made on the transcript, right? The correction was actually to his report, is what I understand. Is that right? Yeah, to the supplemental report. Yeah, okay. it's it's uh, later was discovered, um, and uh, that word was changed to who shot him. Okay, so the transcript's actually accurate. Yes. Uh, I also made the correction on the first line of the of the supplemental report. the The case number was listed as twenty one zero one thirty oh six instead of on the report instead of twenty three oh one thirty oh oh six. Okay. That was fixed, and then. Uh, but that's not the transcript, right? That's your an error. Both are errors in your report. Yeah, no, the transcript the only error was that the the he for a who. Okay. Which the who is a correct one? And could we have the? I'm sorry. This is not the wrong right one. Pardon me. I have a blank screen for a minute. Ready. I was afraid somebody had shot it because, it, you know, some of those, there, there was a shot fired and I didn't know what it was about. Okay. Okay. So I went out to get the horse. I always bring him in and feed him, put him in another pasture. I went out there to get him. And y'all guys, did you, you weren't over here? Yeah, I was here. I was Y'all walked all over that. And the Border Patrol worked all over it. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe this happened after you left. So I don't know. Body right now? There's a body right now. Is and a I fresh don't, body? Yes. By fresh. I didn't, I didn't, as soon as I saw it, I backed away from it. Oh. It's lying face, face down. Okay, let's yeah. go. Let's go. It's, it's dead, though. Uh -huh. The body, the, 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 it's a person in so, it. So when, when, when do you think it, it, it passed away? Or I have. You don't know who it is? Or is it a human being? Is it a I, I have no I have no way of, of, of being a judge of this. He was a mule. You know what a mule is. He's a drug runner. He's got a he has he, he has a pack on his back. A small pack on his back. Uh -huh. Now as you remember I, we saw five to ten drug runners coming through with large backpacks. On. I think yeah, that's what yeah. I heard. He did not have a large backpack on, but he has a small and he's in hand here and camo and he's a drug runner. Uh, okay. So and you just found him? I just as soon as I found him came straight back to the call. 
I can call Border Patrol because they were the first ones I called. Okay. Because I didn't really know how to call you guys. So I called Border Patrol, Jerry Morissette. He called the Border Patrol agent, uh, and, and they said, and he said, they're going to call the sheriff, and they'll send someone out there. Then your your secretary or, or dispatcher, I suppose, called me. I was on the phone with her when you drove up. Okay, okay. And she said, he's coming out right now. Okay, uh, and, 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 and I'm going to get my what happened to this person? You know, I have no idea. You shot him? Or I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. And you know, if you were me, you got no idea. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Let's go check it out. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. You can pull I'll in there right you. behind my car. Okay. You go ahead. I'll, I'll walk. I'm going to leave the gate open. Yeah. My dog's going to bother me. The two black ones? Huh? The two black ones? Yeah, they're good. Yeah. Okay. okay. They won't bother you. I'm sorry that you had to drag you out, but this is something that it ain't it's serious. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it ain't like somebody stole my popcorn. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. need an EMT, but you will need a coroner. And I, and where this body is, my my wife was here. You know, she saw y'all walking all out there. Mm -hmm. She said they walked, and I, my wife knows where it is. She said they walked all over. Yeah. So could've. it could be a body that, it could be the body could have expired after y'all were here. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. You don't know yet. Stuff running around all over this place all the time. You know. Yeah. How far is it from here? Right over here. Well, I'm going to get a taxi there. Okay, I'll, I'll he start heading over there. You can, you can, you can park right there at that, that horse trailer. See the horse trailer? Yeah. The tractor? Uh huh. Park right there, and we'll go through the gate, and I'll take you straight to it. Okay. I'll be, I'll be there about tonight. What is the reason? What do you want to tell the other person? And Deputy, is that the recording of your conversation with Mr. Kelly? Yes. Did you turn your recorder off at that point? Yes, when he was leaving to his house to get his jacket. Can you turn off the screen? Now, Deputy, I want to show you a, a map of the area that's been admitted as State's Exhibit 114. And can you tell me where it is that you came into the property and where you went with Mr. Kelly? And in front of you is a, is a stylus, a pen. And if you touch in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it'll give you a color. And you can either draw, or if you touch, it'll put an arrow. I think it's because I didn't click the slideshow. I just didn't click the slideshow. It was my fault. Is that a, a map of the area? It's an aerial view. It's not a map. So I'm sorry. An aerial, an aerial view of the area. Yes. Yes. If I zoomed it in, would it be helpful for you? Yes, <laughs> definitely. And do you see um, a gate? Do you see the gate where you mentioned that you met with Mr. Kelly? Can you zoom in a little bit more? I can't, actually. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> OK, I don't see the gate, but it should be. 
like around there. Is it possible it's a little further north than that? Objection leading. And you can move that screen a little if you need to. It's north of it's north of the house, but okay. So you you think the the it's in that area somewhere. The first gate. Okay. And when you came through the gate, where did you meet with Mr. Kelly? Was it at the gate? Yes, at the gate. And where did you pull in? Um, when he opened the gate, we stopped right there. That when we when I was talking to him and he was I was recording, then. Uh, as I came in slowly, um, uh, I at the end I went to the south side of the property uh, where the tractor and the the trailer was at. Do you see that in this in this um, aerial view? Do you have a glare on your screen or are you having trouble seeing it? It's probably in this area. Okay. So that's the area you per pulled your patrol car? Yes. And then what did you do once you got to that area? Um, he was walking from his house back back to where I was at. Uh, I. Uh, and what had he done at his house? Do you know? He said he was going to pick up a jacket and he would meet with me over there and so he could take us or take me to the to the site where the body was was located. Okay. And so you waited for him there by the trailer? Actually, it, took, it was only like a minute. Okay. Um, he was already coming back. I parked and I was looking at him. He was coming. As soon as he arrived, um, there was another patrol car coming and do you know what time that was that the other patrol car arrived it was like uh approximately 6 15 p.m p.m 6 17 6 16. and who was in that other patrol car it was uh sergeant uh, omar rodriguez and did he pull his patrol car near where you were yes he parked uh approximately 10 feet from my patrol car. And what happened when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived? I was already off my vehicle and Mr. Kelly was also with me. And he, he when we saw the, when he saw the patrol car arriving, he asked if, who it was and I told him it was one of the sheriffs. And what did Sergeant Rodriguez do when he, when he got there? He came straight to us. And when he got there, what did he um, ask Mr. Kelly to do? Uh, I don't remember what he asked, but Mr. Kelly did mention that there was a, a flashlight that he left where the body was at. Okay. And so at this point, Mr. Kelly's telling you he left a flashlight near the body? He told uh, uh, Sergeant Rodriguez. Okay. And after he told Sergeant Rodriguez that, what did Sergeant Rodriguez do next? Um, well, Mr. Kelly uh, was talking to him and uh, I was behind him. And then uh, he told him about the flashlight and Mr. Mr. Kelly told him about the flashlight. So he, so he, which, and pointed over there. He then, uh, Sergeant Rodriguez um, asked him if uh, he was armed. And what did Mr. Kelly say? He said he was. And what happened after that? Uh, Sergeant Rodriguez told him that it, um, if it was okay, if he could leave his gun uh, uh, here instead of uh, carrying it over there. Mr. Kelly, uh, uh, if he was um, good uh, to leave it, and, and Mr. Kelly said yes. And... What did Mr. Kelly do at that point? Um, he took his gun from uh, his waist, and I don't remember if I got it myself or he put it himself in, in the trailer because the trailer was like maybe 10 feet from us, 12 feet. 
What kind of trailer? It's a small horse trailer. But in any event, somehow Mr. Kelly's uh, weapon that he had on his waist was left in the trailer. Yeah, the door was, um, it was on, on, the, on the back door inside. In the back door on the inside of the trailer. Uh -huh. And then what did y'all do next? Um, we proceeded to follow him uh, or go with him um, towards, a, towards a, the other gate that's next, that's right next to it. We, we then um, walked towards the, the area where the, the flashlight was at and the do you know what time this was? No, it was fairly quick. Uh, when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived, uh, it was probably four minutes later. Okay. And and so you head toward the area where the flashlight's hanging in the tree. Is that right? Yes. And where was that on this map, generally, if you know? Yeah, generally, it was uh, probably somewhere in this area. Okay. Um, and so how did you get there? Uh, walking. Do you, do you, did you mark this area at all, or are you just guessing? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, you circled an area on the map. Did you document that in any way with GPS or with anything not of that me, nature? Not me. <clears throat> Somebody else did that? Somebody else did that. So the circle you just made? It's, it's technically, that a guess? It's technically <laughs> east of the house of the ranch house, um, south, southeast. So that area, that circle you just drew is not southeast of the ranch house, is that right? It's to the east of the house where the body was at. I don't didn't get the coordinates or anything, but I know we walked uh, to that side. Okay. And how did you get there when you walked? Was there, were you just hiking through the grass or was there a path or how did you get there uh there was uh grass and uh i believe there was a little path but it was not too not too uh, marked uh i don't really remember but um it was like a three minute walk two three minute walk so you walked for two or three minutes and what did you find after you walked for two or three minutes? When we got there, um, I did see a body and I just stopped right there before we all stopped. Uh, then Sergeant Rodriguez uh, approached the body and uh, started examining it to make sure it was, it was if, or if, check if, if the person was still alive. Did Sergeant Garcia have some conversation with Mr. Kelly at this point? It was Sergeant Rodriguez, not I'm Garcia. Sorry. Did Sergeant Rodriguez have some conversation with Mr. Kelly at this point? Yeah, they did, did have a small talk and uh, and he went straight to the to the body. Did you document the conversation between Sergeant Rodriguez and Mr. Kelly? No, he he probably documented it himself. Okay. Do you recall the conversation at all? No, I just uh, remained uh, there because uh, the two dogs were also nearby. Uh, I concentrated on not disturbing or leaving any because I know there was going to be some footprints or something. So I just stood there with Mr. Kelly and, and we he stayed with me as well. And uh, while well, Sergeant Rodriguez examined the body. And then what's the next thing that happened? Well, uh, I was able to see from, from from where I was standing, probably more than 10 feet, the, there was a, a person lying face down and he had a stain of blood on his right side. That's I, I could see that there was a black radio to next to him and then a little uh, fanny pack on the side as well. The person had a tactical boots. I don't remember what he was wearing, but um, soon after, uh, Sergeant Rodriguez 
said the person was deceased. Okay, I'm gonna show you next what's been marked as States Exhibit 35, um, image number 0038, that's already been admitted. <clears throat> Is this what you observed when you were there that day? Yes. And you talked about a tree with a flashlight in it. Is that the tree in the background you're referring to? I don't see the flashlight, but yeah, it should be a tree next about 10 feet from, from where it was, from and where does, the body was. Does that appear to be accurate? Fairly accurate. And I see some lights in the background. Is that the Kelly residence in the background? I think I think so. Do you know? Yeah, the tree because the tree was to this side and it was point the house was to that side as well. So is that does that appear to be accurate? Yes, it would be the house, okay. the ranch. So after you're there and Mr. Kelly and Mr. and Sergeant Rodriguez have a conversation, um, what's the next thing that you do? Sergeant Rodriguez uh, told me that uh, we should go back and, 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 and take the, the dogs to the, to the residence. And what was the reason for taking the dogs? Do you know? because they were running around and uh, he didn't want the scene disturbed. And so did you do that? Yes, me and Mr. Kelly, we, we went back and we took the dogs. And when you got back, um, what's the next thing that happened? Well, from there we walked all the way to the, his house the same route we took when we left the patrol cars. We passed through the through the trailer, kept going, walked all the way to the house, uh, to the garage area, and uh, he left his two dogs uh, inside. After he did that, where did you and Mr. Kelly go at that point? We then went back and walked to the patrol cars and stayed uh, outside near the patrol cars. And what's the next thing that happened? Um, I told them that we were going to wait uh, for um, more uh, assistance from uh, uh, deputies to come and, and, and then we remained there for probably more than 40 minutes. And at one point, did Sergeant Rodriguez ask you to do something? Yeah, uh, I believe we were there um, when Sergeant Rodriguez told me to remove the the gun from the trailer and secure it in my patrol car. And did you do that? Yes, I did. And what? Who who arrived next to the scene? I know more deputies arrived. Uh, we were there. I believe it was um, I'm not sure if it was a deputy. And that's okay. It doesn't matter who was the next person to arrive. But at some point, did Sergeant Garcia arrive at the scene? Yes, they all uh, they started arriving, and but since I was over with Mr. Kelly, they never met with me or anything that's I knew I know that they started coming in uh, more patrol cars did you see what Sergeant Garcia did at that point when she arrived no at some point did Sergeant Pacheco arrive yes he, he did arrive and what did Sergeant Pacheco um, say when he arrived he later um, went to where I was at and uh, met with Mr. Kelly. And what did he do with Mr. Kelly? He told him uh, he needed to get a statement from him and uh, 
told him he was going to head down to the, well, uh, told him that he needed to go with him because he needed a statement from him. And before he did that, did he search him? He uh, he retrieved uh, his um, cell phone uh, magazine with ammo and a folding knife with, in a pouch. And what did he do with those items? He gave them to me. And after he retrieved those items, did he place Mr. Kelly in handcuffs? Mr. Handcuff, Mr. Kelly was, was placed in handcuffs. Was there some issue about putting gloves on Mr. Kelly because it was cold as well? If you recall. I don't recall. I don't. And so after he handed those personal items over to you, what did he do next? What did he do? He left with Mr. Kelly from where we were standing. And uh, from there, I just remained at my patrol car and uh, secured the items inside my patrol car as well. And then um, Sergeant Juvia Garcia came up to me shortly after and uh, provided me with a, a crime scene log that she had already started and told me to uh, stay there. I moved myself to where the other patrol cars were at, the, the ones that followed. And uh, from there, I uh, just remained there logging in whoever came or whoever left and while I was in charge of the crime scene log. At some point later that evening, did detectives arrive? Yes. Uh, and there were detectives there earlier as well, correct? Yes, uh, Sergeant uh, Alfonso Flores arrived. And did Sergeant Flores go out to where the body was located with Sergeant Rodriguez, if you know? I never saw him with me, so he was probably over there. Okay, he wasn't with you, so you don't know where he was. I don't know where he was. Okay. Now, later that evening, did detectives arrive with a search warrant? Yes. What time was that? I don't recall the time, but um, they uh, began searching inside the inside the residence was that um before or after midnight if you know um, i don't recall okay probably after midnight and when at some point the items that you had in your patrol car did you turn those over to someone else yes at the end uh when they uh, were in, in the residence, uh, they told us that I, we could leave sometime like 1 a.m. So before leaving at that time, I passed those informations to, to uh, Detective uh, Mario Barba. I told him I have those items and I gave it to him uh, at, at that time. So just so we're clear, you said that you had um, Mr. Kelly's handgun from the trailer, is that right? Yes, and then the three other items. And do you know, was that a forty caliber handgun? Do you know? I wouldn't even know. So you just turned over whatever it was that you took from the trailer to Mario Barbo? Yeah, from the trailer and then the, the three items. And then the three items you turned over were the cell phone, the magazine with the ammo, and the pouch with the folding knife. Yes. Did you do anything else at the scene? Or was that the end of your involvement? That was the end of the involvement. I mean, technically I just stayed with Mr. Kelly all that time until Sergeant Pacheco arrived and, and took with him. I did speak with him as well. Okay, that's all I had, Your Honor, thank you. All right, thank you. This is a good time to break for our mid-morning break. Uh,
let's we'll take a 30 minute break so um we'll be back about 10 20. we'll be in recess until about 10 20. okay so nothing <clears throat> shocking i guess um not a lot of people can figure out where they are based on an aerial map pointing down i wonder how i would do i don't know i don't know it, it was a traumatic event but maybe they see it all the time i don't know okay here we go Rise. Thank you. Everyone, please have a seat. The record is sure back on the record. All the jurors are present, counsel and defendant, and the defense can cross examine. Oh, let's get the witness back on. There he comes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I just wanna go back to, you responded to the first call that happened in this case earlier in the day, is that right? Yes. But that was just very briefly, you sort of touched base with Sergeant Garcia and then you were done, is that right? Yeah, I remained there a few minutes. So. Okay, but you'd seen the property and you knew where it was from going on that first call, right? Yes. And then later in the evening, you are doing Operation Stone Garden near Duquesne Road, correct? Yes. I think you said that you were on a Forest Service road that connects with Duquesne Road. Is that right? Yes. That Forest Service road, is that to the east generally of Mr. Kelly's property? Um, southeast probably. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's on, the south, on the east side. So Duquesne Road generally sort of goes west to east, right? East-west? Duquesne Road? It's on the east side of his his residence. The Forest Service Road, right? The Duquesne Road. And then uh, Duquesne Road has several dirt roads that, or Forest Service roads that start from it. And those kind of connect up with each other and eventually go to the end of the wall. Is that right? Some of them, the one where I was at, it's it's one of those that leads to that area. Okay. That's not on Mr. Kelly's property, correct? Uh, no. That's some distance away from his property, correct? It's a Forest Service road. So. Do you know how far away it is from Mr. Kelly's property? No, you can't see the, I mean, I wasn't able to see the, look for the house from there. I was just on that road. Okay. And it took you some time when you got the call to drive out to Mr. Kelly's property, right? Yes. About how much time? Do you remember? Probably a little bit more than 10 minutes. And so the Forest Service Road is about a 10 minute drive away from Mr. Kelly's property, more or less? Yes, because like I said, it leads to the border. So I was like, not a, I was farther in on that road. Okay, so you go back to Duquesne Road and then over. I gotcha. And when you get to Mr. Kelly's property, you turn on your recording, is that right? Yes. Why did you turn on the recording that you had with you? Um, to get the facts, the initial facts. What kind of a device is that? Is that something you carry with you or something you leave in your car? It's it's a small, uh, it should be recorder, um, probably an inch, Do you, two, three. It's not a body cam, correct? No, it's not. It's not something that you wear on you when you answer calls, no. right? You carry it with you in your car? 
Yes. And you bring it out if you ever think I need to record something. Is that right? Yes. Do other deputies have the same recording devices in their cars? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. But yours was issued to you from the sheriff's department? Yes. Okay. So you take this recording out and you begin to record when you arrive at Mr. Kelly's property, right? Yes. And that's the recording that we heard and that's the transcript that you have in front of you, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And you mentioned making a correction to your police report, right? Yes. And I want to just kind of drill down on that a little bit. So you document in your police report what you believe Mr. Kelly said to you. Is that correct? I document what I heard of the recording. Okay. So when you write this police report, this is January 30th. Do you remember when you wrote your police report? I wrote it uh, probably the following day, maybe two days later. Okay. And when you were writing that report, did you listen to the recording or were you writing this from memory? No, we, I listened to the recording to in order to to put in the what he said. Okay. And in your report, um, do you have it in front of you by any chance? No. If you don't, I can show it to you. But in your report, it says, I asked him, meaning at Mr. Kelly, I asked him if he shot him, and he said he had no idea. Does that sound like what you documented in your report that you later had to correct? Yes. Okay. So how did you become alerted to the fact that this was wrong? What you wrote down in your report was wrong and you needed to correct it. Because um, I had a transcript, which is the one that I have here in front, um, that I had I reviewed um, later on uh, at the county attorneys just to make sure that everything was correct. And that's where I, I saw the discrepancy. And that's a pretty significant discrepancy, correct? Yes. Because originally you wrote down that Mr. Kelly stated in response to your question, did you shoot this person? He stated, I don't know, essentially. That's initially how you documented that in your report, right? He said he didn't know. That's what you documented in your report initially, correct? I don't have the report with me, so I need to see Do you want to, to take a look it's... at it? Can you pull up on his screen so he can take a look at the report? And you should be able to see it on your screen in a minute. And it's in the second paragraph there. Oh, yeah, I see it. You see it? Mm -hmm. And so it says, I asked him if he shot him, and he said again he had no idea. Right. Uh huh. He said. And so that the implication there is that you asked Mr. Kelly directly, "Did you shoot this person?" And he said, "I don't know." Right. That's that's the implication of what you documented in your report. Right. The report. And that was not correct. Right. No, it was um, who shot him. And that that completely changes the meaning, right? Yes. If you ask Mr. Kelly who shot him, and he said, "I have no idea." That's very, very different, right? Yes. And so you obviously needed to make that correction because that was. Okay, wait a second. Hold on one second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That doesn't sound right. Like, like he read his whole transcript all over again and saw that one word was wrong and then remembered that that one word was wrong. That's a pretty big word to get wrong. I don't know. I, I can't imagine. I. I can't imagine him seeing that after the fact. I just, I don't know. That's, that doesn't sound right. It just doesn't sound right, guys. It was a significant error, right? Yes. And it's a really a good thing that you had this recording, right? Yes. Because then you could look back and go, oh, wow, I wrote down the wrong words in my report. I need to change those, right? Yes. And that only happened when you reviewed the transcript, correct? That's when you caught that error? Yes, when, when uh, since it's on the transcript, it's like word by word. 
You stopped recording Mr. Kelly at some point, correct? Yes. Why did you stop recording him? Uh, he went to pick up his jacket and I stopped uh, the recording uh, when he left to the house. And why did you stop the recording? Because he was not with me at that time. He left to his house. But then he came back and joined you and showed you where the body was, right? Yeah, he came to meet with us, with me at the, near the trailer. And just to be clear, when he first encountered you and you came up to the house, he said that there was a dead body and it was a person, correct? He said it was a, a dead, a fresh body. And if you just, do you have the transcript in front of you? Yeah. And it's on page one and I'm looking at line number nine, number 21. Do you see that? Oh, yeah, it's, it says it's, it's a person. So that's the first time he's encountered law enforcement on his property since he discovered this body, right? That's you, right? You're the first person he encounters, right? After discovering the body? Yes. Yeah, he said he called the Border Patrol and then they right. called us and I got there first. You got there first. And he tells you there's a dead body, there's a person here, right? Yes. Okay. And so after he goes to the house to get his jacket and he takes you out to go see the body, why don't you start recording again at that point? My recorder, I put it in the console. And uh, when uh, Officer Rodriguez was, was, was uh, arriving to the gate, I stepped down the vehicle and left it in, 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 in the console, center console. Was it out of battery or something, or did you just no, leave it there? No, I inadvertently left it there because I had put it in there when I was uh, uh, when I stopped recording. Okay, and uh, Rodriguez, he wasn't recording either, as far as you know, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I don't know. And any conversations then that you have with Mr. Kelly at when Rodriguez is there are, to your knowledge, not recorded, right? From my part, they're not. Okay. When you you went out to go see where the body was with Rodriguez and Mr. Kelly, is that right? Yes, we the three of us went over there. And I think you said that Rodriguez examined the body. Mm -hmm, Mr. What yeah. did he do to examine the body? Can you explain that? He kneeled down and he had his back on onto us, but he I I know he was checking for for a pulse on the body. You know he was checking for a pulse. Well, like I said, I mean, he, he, minutes later, he said the body was, was deceased. Okay. So he was checking to see if it was alive. Do you remember if he put gloves on before he did that? No, I wouldn't. That was kind of maybe a 10 feet, a little 12, 13 feet. So you don't remember and you didn't see that? Like I said, I stayed, okay. I stayed far from the body so as to not disturb and then he walked to it and uh, now uh, down and, and uh, started checking on, on, on the body. Did you see him lift up any part of the body or touch the body in any way? I didn't, I don't recall. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if okay. he lifted the body or not, but I, he did say minutes later, a few seconds later that it was not alive. Okay. And you don't recall if he touched the fanny pack or the backpack or anything like that either, no. right? Okay. You go back. So Rodriguez tells you essentially to go back with Mr. Kelly, right? And to go wait somewhere away from the body? No, he tells tells me to go with him so the, the dogs can be uh, secured. Okay. The dogs and you and Mr. Kelly then leave the area. Do you know if anybody, whether Rodriguez or, or you, did anybody look for tracks around this body? When I left with the dogs, 
I didn't come back to the scene. I, okay. So I'm I'm not sure who who looked for tracks or if Sergeant Rodriguez did or I don't know who. But you didn't look for any tracks. Not me. Okay. What were the dogs doing around this body? Could you observe their behavior? I do remember when we were walking towards the body the first time to see where it was. One of the dogs like went to the area when we were walking and kind of sniffed around. But uh, that's what I remember. Uh, the dogs were like not sitting uh, next to us or anything. Uh, they were they were there, but um, that's the only thing I can recall when, when we were heading there that one of the dogs was in the area kind of stopping and sniffing, but we were still uh, walking to the to the body. That's, that's what I remember. Okay. And then you wanted to move the dogs away from the body so that they wouldn't contaminate the crime scene. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, Sergeant Rodriguez told me to move him. Okay. Uh, take, that we take him to the house. I gotcha. And then you said that you're with Mr. Kelly, and at some point, I think you said it was Pacheco comes and puts him in handcuffs and says, we need to get a statement from you. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Sergeant Pacheco arrived later on and, and told him he needed a statement from him. And then put him in handcuffs and took him yes. in. Nobody attempted to get a statement from Mr. Kelly on the scene. Is that right? No. Uh, when, no when I walked, we just walked to his house and do you have any idea why nobody asked him any questions on the scene about what happened? Well, from my part, um, when we when we saw the body and it was deceased, I mean, we know that we're going to need a statement from him, uh, but it's got to be a formal one, so so no questions were asked. And nobody from asked my side. Him, nobody asked him to demonstrate on his property this is what i saw this is where i was this is what i did nobody asked him to do that correct not from my part okay so they just took him in and took him without asking him anything on the scene i want you to describe this area for me just a little bit um because you were there earlier in the day and then you came for this second call as well can you see the border wall from this property? I don't recall. I know when I got there the first time, I went around and towards uh, the, the south side, southwest side, and uh, where, the, where the vehicle for Sergeant Garcia was at. She was on the, on the, on the, on the road, on dirt road. So that's when I met with her, but I don't, I really don't recall viewing the wall. You can probably see it from there, but uh, from my part that day, I didn't look for the wall or anything. I just went over there and see if we could find Mr. Kelly because okay. of the concern that. It would be pretty far off in the distance then. Is that fair to say? Yes. So if a witness described the border wall as being just two football fields away from this property, that would not be accurate. Is that right? Like I said, I mean, I don't know how far the wall is from there. It's, 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 it's not near. It's if it were two football fields away, you would have seen it, right? I would have seen it. And if a witness, you saw where this body was in relation to this house. Is that right? Yes. If a witness said that this body was 10 yards away from the house, that would be incorrect, right? It was. Who said it was 10 yards away from the house? I'm everything I heard so far was 150, 160. Okay. Well, feet or yards? Now I have no idea. Yards. hundred. That's what they said. 150, 160 yards away from the house, right? Who said 10 yards? To the east and uh, probably more than 200 feet. So 10 yards Easily. is definitely not Because he's got a fence. He's got like a uh, horse fence. Um, and and then my from, question is just 10 yards is no, definitely not, not correct, yards. right? Yes. 
When you were on the way, when you were responding to this call, did you receive? Maybe it was that first guy. I can't remember his name now. It's been so long. Yeah, it was probably that first guy. Information that you got from dispatch prior to arriving. They uh, said that Mr. Kelly said he had struck something. That's all I remember from the, and I headed straight over there to the, from where I was at. And you heard that on dispatch. So that was in your mind when you're out there. Mr. Kelly said he struck something, right? Yes. Did you later learn that that was not accurate? Uh, what, that he had struck something? That Mr. Kelly had never said he had struck something. I'm not even sure. I haven't reviewed the radio logs or I mean the recordings. But um, So you don't know who reported that or how it got transmitted to dispatch, right? You don't know, right? No. Okay. Uh, I heard, I know they said it was from Border Patrol. Okay. So Mr. Kelly calls Border Patrol, Border Patrol calls dispatch, and then dispatch puts something out to you, correct? Yes. Okay. We have a moment, Your Honor. Just a couple more, Judge. Um, when Rodriguez was checking the body, did he? Did you notice any blood stains? Did you see anything like that? I saw, like on this area, a uh, blood stain. Okay, and that's when you were standing further away after you yeah, went out. Yeah, I never out. got next to the body or anything. Uh, just from the distance that I was at, that's where I saw. And as far as you know, other than taking the dogs away from the area where the body was located, did did they do anything to protect the crime scene at that point? Did who? Did anybody that you know of do anything to protect the crime scene at that point? I left with the dogs and uh, Sergeant Rodriguez remained there. From there on, I didn't, I don't know uh, what happened there. Was but it, he stayed, uh, he stayed there. Was it dark outside? It started getting dark. Okay. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. Redirect examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Deputy, was there anyone around to protect this crime scene from? Uh, yes, Sergeant Rodriguez. So, I mean, was there anyone in the area that you needed to like protect the crime scene from? That's the question. Is this a rural area? Yes. Is there anybody on the property other than Mr. Kelly who's with you that you're aware of? Uh, at that time, no. Uh, I know that probably his wife was in, in, in the house, but I'm not sure if she was or not. Are there crowds of people milling around that you need to make sure don't make their way to the body? No. And you just pointed a minute ago during cross-examination to where you saw a blood stain on the victim. Could you uh, could you point to that again? To to where? Where you said you saw the blood stain on the victim? Somewhere in this area. Can you stand he up was, and show the jury, please? He was possibly this area. Um, 
the body was laying face down, so I was able to see from where I was standing, which was not next to the body. I was a few feet, but I did see some stain in this area. I mean, I'm not sure if it was right, right in here or right here, but it was on the right side. So somewhere on the right side, and if I'm tell me if I'm describing this correctly, you're describing sort of in the torso area, is that right? Either on the side or in the back. Torso area in, on this like the right side of the torso area, either on the side or in the back, is that right? Yes, some somewhere in there. I mean, I didn't look at I I could see the stain, but um, I mean exactly pinpointed, but okay. I, I did see blood. On the right side of his... On the, his right side, yes. And he's laying face down, so on the back. Yes. Okay. And the issue with your, your report, you corrected that, is that right? Yes, I did. And your recording actually went directly into evidence. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So if anyone wanted to listen to your recording, they could have listened to it right away without your report, correct? Yes. So you don't know if anyone ever actually relied on that error in your report, do you? I don't know. Does anyone at the Sheriff's Department have body cam? Not that I know of. And did they at this time in January, on January 30th of 2023? No, I, I don't think there's nobody, anybody with cams. So you're, the only way you can record is with those recording devices that you referred to, is that right? Yes. And Defense Counsel asked you about the area where you were and how long it took you to get to the get to the Kelly residence. Could you describe how you had to how you had to drive to get there? When the call came out? Yes. So I was second on, call. The second call. Yes, yes. I was um so if you take Duquesne, it leads to um to the the road where I was at, which is FSR 4667, when I was in that area, I was, I mean, like always, like we do, we, we just check to see since it's near the border, just check, go drive slow and check if see if there's anybody, you see any movement. So I was quite in, I don't remember how much further uh, to the, to the, from Duquesne to the, from that. Uh, but, um, when I heard the call, I was like looking out, and then I started coming back. Okay. To the area, and then you have to drive uh, let, let on Duquesne, then on Kino Springs, then on Sagebrush, then towards the house. So it's it takes several minutes to get there. So it's kind of a roundabout way to get back to the Kelly residence. Yes. The Forest Service, or the National Forest, does that is that adjacent to the Kelly property? The yes. And does the Forest Service Road go along the area adjacent, not exactly adjacent to the Kelly property, but near the edge of the Kelly property? Yes. Uh, it's probably south of the property or southeast, but um because they turn around, they, they they curve around, and so I don't know where his property ends. Okay. Um, but for sure, it's 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 his property. It's in the area, but I'm not in the property. I'm like heading towards the border and and those sites on the okay those those roads that that uh, there's several of them, not just one. I mean, so let's talk they about they interconnect. The, let's talk about the main Forest Service road. Does that go north and south? Uh, to Kane. No, the main Forest Service road. Does that go north south? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know because okay, it, it curves around at some point, right? Yeah, there's curves. You gotta go and and and, and go down a ravine or, or 
wash and then cross like it and then guy. keep going. But it's not, they're not straight roads. They're, they're curved roads and they interconnect with other service roads. I don't think I have any other questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Any questions? Any questions for this witness from members of the jury? Very well. I see none. Did you have a question, sir? Okay. I thought you were writing something down. Thank you. All right, uh, sir, you can step down. And is this witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you. The state can call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Dr. Tim. And uh, yeah, I was going to, oh, Jose, let's collect the transcripts. And the record will show that um, we've collected the transcripts that were distributed for demonstrative purposes. Morning. You can come over here, please, and have a seat. Good morning, Dr. Tim. Good morning. Can you just briefly introduce yourself to the jury? I'm Dr. Krista Tim, T-I-M-M. -M. And where do you work? In I work at the Pima County uh, Medical Examiner's Office. So you don't work for the county. You don't work for the sheriff's department here in Santa Cruz County. No, I do not. You don't work for sheriff. You don't work for Santa Cruz County in any capacity, right? Correct. And oftentimes, sometimes the county, like Santa Cruz, will ask for the services of Pima County to help out with cases like this, right? Yeah, we cover uh, medical examiner office duties for uh, Santa Cruz County and various other office offices in Arizona. And how long have you been with the um, your department? Uh, five years. And let's talk about your education experience. Where'd you Where'd you go to school? I graduated from medical school at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I then did a pathology, anatomic pathology residency at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I then did a forensic fellowship at the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office, which is now Medical Examiner's Office, also in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm board certified in anatomic and forensic pathology. Well, how'd you get into this line of work with uh, autopsies? Through um, pathology training. Um, I guess I was initially exposed during my medical school training. Um, one of the pathologists there was responsible for covering autopsy service. And um, so I was in medical school when I first saw my first autopsy and kind of just found pathology and forensic pathology through exposure. It's just a curious question of how people come into the careers they are at. So that's more of a curiosity question. Um, how many autopsies have you done in your five years at Pima County? I don't have a number, but I typically am responsible for about 400 cases a year. Um, not all of those are going to be autopsies, though. What are some of the other cases you work on? Um, external examinations. Um, so if someone has trauma and they've survived it long enough to make it to the hospital, 
um, where they're able to make diagnoses through examination and imaging, um, such as a motor vehicle accident or something along those lines. So if the trauma is well documented, that would still follow fall under our jurisdiction for determining cause and manner of death because it's not natural. Um, but an autopsy wouldn't be required um, most of the time for something like that because the injuries are documented. So the purpose of, would it be fair to say, the purpose of an autopsy is to to determine the manner and cause of death? Mo mostly the cause of death. Okay. And is, um, of those 400 cases, how many are autopsies, approximate per year? How many of them are autopsies? I, I don't, I don't know, maybe half. Okay. There's no test here. There's no, I'm not, I'm not gonna come Yeah, I don't, here. it's not numbers that I keep track of. So, so in five years and you've handled about 2000 cases, autopsies and other examinations, right? Yeah, of my own, correct. Of your own. And how many, how many other doctors are in that, in your, in your work facility, in the department there? Uh, there's a chief medical examiner, a deputy chief medical examiner, there are two other full-time doctors, I call us the worker bee doctors, um, that are handling the bulk of, of the cases. And then we have a split position, so two other doctors that split a full-time position. And we also have a forensic fellow who's in training to become a forensic pathologist. So seven, eight? Seven or eight. And of, of the seven, eight, do you guys do um, like rounds? Do you guys discuss your cases with each other? Yeah, in um, various capacities, but typically our, our day starts um, meeting at eight o'clock uh, where the doctors who are on the schedule for autopsy service that day meet with the chief or the deputy chief, who's whoever's running the meeting for the day, as well as people um, throughout the office, investigators, um, anthropologists, uh, the autopsy assistant staff, um, and students or people that are rotating through, we all get together for a morning morning meeting to discuss the cases that we have to handle that day or in the short term. So it would be fair to say in the five years, you get a pretty good breadth of a variety of cases that come through that office? Yes. And you discuss those cases with other practitioners, right? That's correct. And so before you became um, at the Pima County um, Coroner's Office, what was your career before that, before you stepped into the Pima County? So following my fellowship in forensic pathology and becoming boarded, I stayed on at the Cuyahoga County uh, Coroner's Medical Examiner's Office. And I worked there for, as a forensic pathologist from 2010 till 2015, um, at which point in time I took a job in Denver um, and was working as a forensic pathologist at the Denver office of the medical examiner. I worked there up until I was offered a position um, in Pima County in Tucson um, in 2019 when we moved here or moved to Tucson. So I've worked as a forensic pathologist my entire career. So let's just jump to, were you involved in a case dealing with um, a, a shooting on January 30th? Yes, I was. How were you involved and how, how did, let me just, how did you get involved? I was uh, the autopsy, the autopsy physician. Um, I was, uh, it was a case that was assigned to me uh, that day. And would that be just, you guys are all on call and certain people accept the phone call or someone's on duty and that's the call they take, right? Um, the schedule is made out months in advance and most days of the month, there's gonna be either what's called a D1 or a D2 doctor. So the primary doctor is the D1 doctor. They're gonna be assigned the cases that come in that or are more complicated or that law enforcement is gonna to wanna to be in attendance for. Um, and then after that, it's the D2 doctor is going to do the rest of the workload um, for the day, typically. Although the caseload has increased and now we have a D3 doctor a lot of days, so. And were you asked to perform an autopsy on a body that came into your facility? Yes. Do you remember what day that was? Um, I could look at my report. Sure, if you want to refresh your recollection, you can look at your report. And just for the record, that's going to be Government Exhibit 14. On uh, February 1st, 2023. You remember what time of day that was? 
Uh, the autopsy began at, at oh wait, 30. 8.30 in the morning. Correct. Do you remember the individual's name that you performed the autopsy on? Uh, Gabrielle Butimia. I'm gonna show you, just for us, not for publication, I'm gonna show you a picture from your autopsy report. Do you recall that picture? I do not. You don't recall that picture? No. Oh, okay. Let me go to your, recall your, you have your report in front of you? I have my report, right. yes. Who is in attendance with you during the autopsy? Uh, myself, Detective Ainza, and Deputy Barba from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, and Chief uh, Deputy Attorney Hunley from the Santa Cruz County Attorney's Office. And is what is witnessed by. Okay. And doing your autopsy, what walk the jury through what you do in an autopsy? So an autopsy is a medical procedure, um, typically for understanding the physiological or anatomic derangements that occur as to why a death comes about. Um, it starts with an external examination in which we look at the outside of the body. We're looking for any um, areas of trauma, any evidence of therapeutic intervention, any scarring. We document basic body habitus, meaning the body length and the weight, looking at the hair, the dentition, fingernails, um, just an overall appearance of the body is documented through the external examination. Um, during that process, we take pictures or um, allow for people in attendance to take pictures, documenting all the things that we see. Um, and then we will move on to the internal portion of the examination in which we're looking at documenting the same things, right? So we're looking for trauma, we're looking for evidence of therapy, uh, we're looking for evidence of previous surgeries, really to, to gain an understanding as to why this person died. Um, during that process, we also can collect fluids from the body, um, blood for toxicology testing, vitreous fluid, the blood, the fluid from the eyes for toxicology or electrolyte testing, um, urine, anything else that might be uh, pertinent to the case that we're working on. Um, and then the, bo the body organs are removed and then we section the organs with a knife um, to look for evidence of natural disease or documenting trauma. Um, so each organ process or is processed in a similar fashion. We collect small samples that will be put in a fixative. If we wanted to look at them under the microscope, sometimes the cause of death isn't um, often um, identifiable by the naked eye, and we can look at them under the microscope so they can be embedded in paraffin and cut into glass slides, which will come back to us about a week later, and we can look at those slides under the microscope. Things such as like an acute heart attack might not be visible grossly, but under the microscope, we can see the changes um, and make, make those diagnoses better. Um, and then um, pictures can be taken along the way, and and the organs are all returned into the body cavity. The body is sewn and released to the funeral home or wherever the family chooses to um, have the remains taken after we're finished. At that point in time, I will dictate uh, my findings to a transcription company who then generates a report and sends it back to me. And then I wait for the toxicology test to come back, the results from that. Um, slides if they've been uh, processed and take time and review all of all of that at the time when I'm ready to sign the report out. So do you recall, and you recall this, this case, right? You recall, yeah. you recall this victim in this case, right? Yes. Do you recall how the body came to you, came to the morgue? Came to the coroner's office, I mean, do you recall how the, what condition, was it in a bag? Was it, do you recall that? Uh, yeah, it was in a body bag. In a body bag. And Detective Ianza was there. Do you see him at the council table? Yes. And he was there? Yes. And did he, was he in custody of the body? 
Do you know? I do not know. Okay. And then was there an unwrapping of the body, unzipping of the bag? Correct. Okay. And who did that? Did you do that or did Detective Benz? Um, typically, that's that's what I would do. I, I look at the body bag um, and document whether there is a seal on the bag. So if the zipper has a seal around it um, and take a picture, and then I usually cut cut the seal and unzip the bag. I also um, usually have uh, autopsy assistants that are helping with that process. But in cases uh, in which there's you know suspected trauma or inflicted trauma, usually I'm the person who will remove that seal and open the body bag to expose the body and take pictures as to how the body is received in our office. Do you recall if you did that in this case? Um, most likely, yes. That's your habit? Yes. Okay. And do you, did you take photos or did, did Detective Anza take photos? I took photos um, and Detective Anza did. We both okay. did. I'm going to show you one of your photos in Government Exhibit 14. This is your report. Do you recall that photo? Yes. And is that the person that you, you, you received for the autopsy? Correct. You're going to move to admit, and we'll call that 14, Government Exhibit 14A as an apple. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. 14A is admitted. Move to publish, Your Honor. Hold on one second. So, you know what you're going to see, right? So, Your Honor, just for the record, I'm going to keep it very sanitized. That's all so right. I just want to give them a heads up so uh, they uh, they know what they're going to see. So, uh, permission granted. And who is that? You recall. That's the decedent, um, Gabrielle Butimia. I'm going to show you a, a side photo. Government Exhibit 14B is in boy, just for. You recall that photo? Yes. Is that the same individual? Correct. You're going to move to admit Exhibit 14B into evidence. No objections, Your Honor. Thank you. 14B is admitted. Permission to publish, if you want. That's the side angle of of the victim or the the person you you saw that day, right? Correct. We should government exhibit 14C, as in Charlie. Do you recognize that photograph? Yes. We're going to move to admit 14C. No objections, Your Honor. 14C is admitted with permission to publish. Let's walk through that. What do we see? What does the jury see in this photograph? Uh, at the top of the screen uh, is the top of the decedent's, um, is the head and face from the left lateral uh, view, um, the neck and left shoulder. There's a tattoo on the upper outer left arm, um, as well as kind of in the midline, just under the neck, um, the notch of the sternum is the exit gunshot wound. That's the exit wound? That's correct. I'm going to show you a different angle. 14. Do you recognize that photograph? Yes. Is that a different angle of the same injury? Correct. Same exit wound? Yes. Move to admit 14D as in dog. No objection, Your Honor. 14D is admitted. Permission to publish granted. Is that a different angle, Doctor? Yes, this is um, similar area of the body, just from the right side of the body versus the left.
I'm going to show you 14E as in echo. You recognize that photo, doctor? Yes. Move to admit, doctor. Move to admit 14E as an echo. No objection. 14E is admitted, and you have permission to publish. What are we looking at here? What's the jury looking at? Um, so this is the, the back of the body. The first or the last two pictures we looked at were the front of the body. This is after the body has been turned over. Uh, we're looking at the right kind of back side. So the right arm is going to be towards the right side of the screen. The head is at the top of the screen. The feet will be at the bottom of the screen. It's All we see here is the waist. Um, and then just under the right arm on the lateral right back or the side of the right back is the entrance gunshot wound. That's the entrance? That's correct. The entry wound? So I'm going to just show both of them together. Or I'm going to flop. So that's my entry wound, correct? Correct. That's 14E as an echo. And we'll show you 14C as in Charlie, and that's the exit wound, right? Correct. So can you explain how that works? How was the was the bullet doing with the body, the entry and exit wound? So typically, um, in general terms, entrance gunshot wounds are generally going to be more round and regular, um, have smoother margins. They will typically have an associated marginal abrasion that's usually smooth and rounded as well. Um, as the bullet pushes through the skin, it creates that abraded margin. It's hot and it's moving fast. Um, and as it pushes through the skin, um, it also pushes through whatever is underlying that skin. If it's bone, um, uh, especially if it's flat bone, it can create a, a characteristic fracture pattern to that bone. So specifically the skull or flat bone being the sternum, um, sometimes ribs are also flat bones, uh, in which as the bullet pushes through it, it causes what is called beveling, um, in which an entrance gunshot wound will have internal beveling, meaning that there's a punched out margin on the inside of that bone, versus an exit gunshot wound will have external beveling. Um, so as the, as the bullet is leaving the body, pushes through that bone, it breaks outwardly. Um, so internal beveling, entrance, external beveling, exit for flat bones. Tubular bones, which are the bones of the extremities, are, are not um, typically going to, you're not going to have those features associated with them. Um, so it's something that we see most commonly with the skull, um, but we look forward in other areas of the flat bones as well. So you can determine based upon the injury, entry and exit. Correct. So the jury knows 14 E is an echo. That is an entry wound in your opinion. Correct. And that's the right flank side of the victim. The lateral right back. And 14 C is in Charlie. You can tell in your opinion, that's an exit wound. That's correct. And so can you tell the jury the trajectory of the bullet that's going through? I mean, is it, Easy for you to describe and show how that bullet is traveling? Sure. Um, the, it, it's going from the right to the left, and it's going from the back to the front and upward in the body. That's the trajectory of the bullet in the body. And what, in, in your autopsy finding, what does it, when that bullet enters the victim's body, what is it going through? What, what organs and bones and tissue does it go through? Can I refer to my record? Sure. Yeah. sure. After perforating uh, the skin and soft tissues of the right lateral back, it goes through the posterior lateral right sixth and eighth rib, sixth, seventh, and eighth ribs, all of them. Um, intercostal soft tissues, so that's like the muscles and arteries and veins between the ribs, is the intercostal soft tissues. Um, there's associated internal beveling of the ribs that are fractured. It then passes through the right lung with injuries of the lower, middle, and upper lobes of the right lung. Um, 
the pericardial sac, which is the fibrous lining around the sac of the heart, around the heart, uh, the ascending aorta. So the aorta is the major artery that leaves the heart that supplies oxygenated blood to your whole body. Um, the ascending part of it, part of it is the first, very first part after it leaves the heart. Um, and then it goes through the sternum, which is the chest plate um, in the middle of, of the chest. And the uh, anterior left second rib, which is right next to the sternum. And there's external beveling, which is, we, as we talked about, associated with exit gunshot wounds. And then it passes through the soft tissue and the skin of the left chest. Uh, there's associated fractures, hemorrhagic lacerations, and uh, retained blood. Uh, in the sac around the heart, there's 50 milliliters of blood in the sac that's surrounding the heart. There's not supposed to be blood in that space. There's typically just a very small amount of clear fluid that serves as kind of a lubricant for the heart when it pumps. Um, there's not supposed to be bl blood in that space at all. And there's 50 milliliters of blood in that space. And there's also 340 milliliters of blood in the right chest cavity. Again, there's not supposed to be blood freely flowing around your lungs um, on the right side of the heart or the right side of the chest. Um, and there's 340 milliliters in the right chest cavity. Would that be significant injuries to the body? Very significant, yes. And is, when you say there's body flowing in the body, would that be like consistent with internal bleeding? Correct. This is um, the blood that is. Uh, still within the body cavities that I'm able to measure at the time of autopsy. And just so we understand, the bullet's coming through the, the right lateral and it's coming out through the chest, mid-plate chest area, right? Correct. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 14F. recognize that photo? Yes. And what's that a photograph of? It's a, it's a closer up picture of the entrance gunshot wound. You're going to move to admit 14F. No objections. 14F is admitted and you have permission to publish. All right, just, you already said it, but just explain one more time what, what we're looking at. Is it? This is a closer up picture. Um, with a ruler of the entrance gunshot wound of the decedent. Um, you can see the central defect and as well as the um, marginal abrasion, that pink area around it um, is where that superficial layer of skin gets um, rubbed off as the bullet pushes through the body, the skin. Is there something to be said about the, the, the shape of the entry wound? In your opinion, anything about the shape of the entry wound? It's, I mean, it's ovoid. It's kind of oval, has an oval shape to it. It's just a description, but I wouldn't call it an irregular, which is what we typically see with, ex, uh, with exit gunshot wounds. This is more rounded and regular with marginal abrasion consistent with an entrance gunshot wound. I'm going to now show you one more photo, 14G as in. You recognize that photograph? Yes. And what's that a photograph of? This is a exit gunshot wound, the exit gunshot wound. You're going to move to admit 14G into evidence? No objection. 14G is admitted and you have permission to publish. Walk the jury through what we're seeing on this photograph. This is the exit gunshot wound. Um, it's more irregular. It's not as rounded. It has kind of angulated um, margins to it. Do you recall if you, the age of the, the victim in this case, the age of this person? Um, 48 years old. And did you have a, a conclusion to what had happened to him? A finding? Yes. What's your finding in this case? 
a perforating gunshot wound of the trunk. Is that consistent with homicide? Uh, the manner of death is homicide, yes. Manner of death is homicide. And you said some of the blood, you've, you took out the organs and some blood and you, you bisected the, the organs and you sent the blood out for testing. Is that what you did? Uh, yes, uh, the organs were examined after they were removed from the body and blood was collected at the time of examination. Um, in, in addition to the fluid from the eyes and urine, uh, and they were sent to the toxicology lab for a toxicology screening. Just one second, Your Honor. As I'm looking, when you, when you conclude your autopsy, what's the standard protocol, what you do with the victim's body? Uh, the but the organs go back in, and uh, the body is sutured, and um, I release the body after I finish with everything. We've gotten everything we need. Um, the body will be released to typically it's a funeral home um, that the family has made arrangements with. You were ta you recall taking like nail clippings and hair and other items from the victim's body. Um, in cases such as this, that's typically routine. Uh, it is done at the request of the investigative agency, and it's usually not done by myself. It's done by the people that are assisting me. Okay, I'm going to show you. This is the only one, Your Honor, I'm going to show, but I want to show you a picture of the, of a, of the injury, well, parts of the injury inside the body. All right, I'm gonna show you what's been marked as 14H. You recognize that photograph? I do. And what's that a photograph of? It's um, the right chest cavity from the inside after the lungs and heart have been removed and the lining over the, lung, the inside of the ribs has been removed. Um, so the pleura is that lining across the lungs that we uh, strip it away. Um, and then it shows the area of fractures on the right lateral chest, um, the rib fractures specifically. From the injury? From the inside of the body. Yep. You're going to move to publish 14H as in house? No objection. 14H is admitted and you have permission to publish. So that's one more time. Just walk us through that. Like you, and you can draw on the board on the screen too. Just walk us through what we're looking at on that photograph. You can't draw, you can't, can you draw or no? Maybe. Oh. I haven't tried. There you go. Okay. Uh, so this is the, this is the vertebral column here from the inside of the body. So your spine, his spine. Um, these little yellow white areas are going to be the ribs. And the pink between them is that intercostal soft tissue, mostly muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, um, and so the lungs and heart had been removed. This is the area of injury. So on the outside, we saw the skin uh, entrance gunshot wound. This is looking at the inside of the wound. And here you see these irregular areas. Um, these are all fractures of those ribs on the right, um, as well as it shows the external beveling on, a, on the ribs that were uh, injured by the, gun, the bun, gunshot wound, the bullet. Did you find in your autopsy, did you find any fragmentation of any bullet inside the body? No. Do you find any, you know what the difference between a full metal jacket and a hollow point is, for example? If you don't, don't worry about it. I'm not a ballistics expert. I have a general idea, um, but it's not my area of expertise. But there's no bullet fragments found in the victim's body, was there? That's correct. And you're familiar with gunshot wounds? Yes. Of, of the five years you were with Pima County, how many gunshot wound autopsies do you think, estimate, how many you've, you've worked on and been consoled on? Too many. Um... Too many. 
And in your opinion, have you, have you seen the difference between, say, a handgun injury versus a long rifle or longer type gun? Yeah, I mean, I've seen shotgun wounds. I've seen rifle wounds. Um, I've seen a lot of handgun wounds. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, probably 100 um, just homicides. Most of those are going to be gunshot wounds. Um, and that doesn't even include the suicide gunshot wounds that I see, which are many more than the homicides. And in your opinion, with the, we got the entry wound. We have the damage we just saw, and then we also have that exit wound. In your opinion, would that be from a handgun, a shotgun, or a, a gun like a long rifle or some different Objection, kind of your honor. Um, she said she wasn't a ballistics expert, wouldn't have that. She just generalizes the type of weapons that she comes across from the knowledge that's given to her. So I don't think she's personally has that skill set to be able to identify the type of weapon. I'm not saying the, the actual weapon. I'm talking about the difference between a handgun, shotgun, and rifle. And she's, she's testified she's seen, quote, too many. And so she's seen all three type of injuries in her career. And so I think she can opine what type of weapon was used for this injury? I agree the objection is sustained for lack of foundation, but you can try to lay additional foundation. Dr. Tim, um, of the homicides that you've dealt with, or including the suicides, they've used uh, most, um, sadly, said most of them are gun related, right? Yes. And, the, and those gun related, if you, how many? how many times have you seen a handgun used in either a homicide or a suicide? The majority. The majority. And when a handgun is used, it, in your opinion, you've, I'm sorry, back up, strike that. When you review a body from a handgun injury, you see the type of damage that, that that handgun can cause, right? Yes. And you can see the internal organs of the body too. I mean, you do the same kind of analysis, like in this case, with a handgun injury, right? Yeah, gunshot wounds are, are processed uh, in a similar fashion, yes. So you see the entry wound? Yes. You see the exit wound? Correct. And you see the damage inside the body? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. You also have done cases with a shotgun? Yes. So you've seen the entry wound? Yes. You've seen the exit wound? Correct. And you also see damage within the body? Yes. And you also have done cases with a rifle, right? Yes. You've seen the entry wound? Yes. Exit wound? Correct. And damage within the body? Yes. Are they different? Um... They can be very different, yes. Can be very different. What's the difference between, say, a handgun versus a long gun? Um, long gun rifle wounds tend to be more devastating. They're higher power. Um, um, so there's going to be more damage to the organs than just uh, a handgun. It's a lower velocity. Um, so they tend to be less um, destructive to the organs. And, and or are you able to give a determination in this case by looking at with your experience? Are you, don't give me the determination yet, but are you able to give a de 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 uh, determination of what type of weapon was used which caused the entry, exit, and damage within the body? The uh, findings at autopsy are most consistent with uh, a rifle. I, I didn't ask that, but I think I laid the foundation for the answer, you judge. May I take the witness on board, Iyer? He did specifically tell her not, not to answer, and she did it anyway. But I think he did, I think he did lay enough foundation. Judge, just roll. Don't let her, poor dear, just roll. 
I think we're almost done with this witness. 20 more minutes. Unless this fight lasts 20 minutes, we don't know. She's not talking. She's not talking. He's probably eating candy. He was able to look at the screen, but it was hard for him. So I'm guessing that's a brother or maybe a son. He was 46. So you remember, members of the jury, in my preliminary instructions, maybe, that one of the things that can happen is a judge, judge strikes the answer. So the, the last answer is stricken. The last answer is stricken because it called for a yes or no answer. The question called for a yes or no answer. And it was specifically phrased that way. And then the witness may have been misinterpreted the question. I don't know, but the witness did not answer yes or no. She gave the answer. So that answer is stricken, and you should not consider it as part of... Um, as part of the evidence of this case. Now I'm allowing, I'm gonna allow defense counsel to what we call voir dire the witness. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. In your training, have you, you said you didn't have any ballistics training, correct? I have ballistics training in the sense that it's part of forensic pathology training. Um, but not in the sense that I'm a ballistics expert. And there are all different types of weapons, correct? Yes. Handguns and rifles, correct? Yes. And there are high-powered handguns um, a, 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 that are out there. Are you aware of that? Yes. And you're trying to testify that a high-powered handgun could have not um, produced this type of injury? I guess it's possible. Okay, but you formed an opinion and I'm trying to figure out where you're getting this opinion. In a lot of your cases, you might have been given the variable of what gun is suspected to be utilized in a shooting, correct? Yes. And matter of fact, you get a narrative and, and there's one in this case where a detective or an investigator puts out there what they believe might have happened, right? Yes. So sometimes when you're forming opinions of types of wounds, you're being provided the information of what type of gun it might be. Isn't that true? Correct. But you weren't trained in distinguishing all the different types of guns and the wounds that it's capable of producing, correct? Not all of them, no. Okay. And there's a lot of guns on the market. Would you agree? Yes. And would you also agree that distance can make a difference of how the wound might look, correct? Yes. And the caliber or the type of bullets that come out of a gun, shotgun versus a BB gun, obviously would be different, right? The types of wounds that you could expect to see. Can you repeat the question? That bullets can make a difference on the type of wounds that might be seen by you. The size of the bullet? Yes. Uh, the, the state asked you about hollow point and different types of other bullets, right? Correct. And in this case, there is no bullet, is there? Uh, there's no retained bullet. You were not shown any bullet that came from this case, correct? Correct. And you didn't find a bullet, correct? So you have no idea if this is a high-powered, larger type of bullet from a handgun or from a long rifle or any other type of rifle, correct? Correct. So I will continue with my objection, Your Honor. The objection sustained. Could you ask the jurors to please disregard? I did. Hold it. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, may I try to... May I try to... Objection sustained. Let's move on. Let me ask you... Question, Dr. Dr. Tim. Would this injury be consistent with a weapon, a gun? 
Can we just agree to that? Would this weapon, would this be consistent with a weapon, a gun? Yes, this is a gunshot wound. The cause of death is a gunshot wound. And did you find in your analysis of the skin or clothing any kind of residue around the injury, both entry and exit or clothing that you may or may not have? Did you find any gun residue? I did not uh, notice any fouling or stippling on the surface of the skin um, at the time of examination, which is burnt and unburnt gunpowder. Um, typically seen in intermediate range gunshot wounds. So a gunshot wound in which there is a mu muzzle to target distance. I'm gonna eject um, is, um, I believe that that was the question and she's going into her own narrative. All right, I'll sustain it, but you can ask another question. Yeah. So we explain to it, once again, explain what stippling is real quick for the jury. Stippling is small punctate abrasions on the surface of the skin around an entrance gunshot wound in which it's an intermediate range, meaning what? the distance from muzzle to target is a few inches up to approximately a foot and a half for most uh, weapons. And there's no such stippling in this case? That's correct. And how about gunpowder residue or residue or... Any of that, anything like that in this case? No. And what would that be indicative of if there was gunpowder residue on the skin? They would both, they're both seen in intermediate range gunshot wounds. Let me ask about correlating in your experience. What's the term correlating referred to? Um, like bringing together information, seeing if it relates. And that's, so in this case, what, what kind of correlation do we do in this case? When you look at an autopsy like this, what do you do? I mean, you're considering a bunch of data points. You're considering entry wound, exit wound, and all those things, right? Sorry, Judge. Oh, thank you. Just walk me through what kind of correlating would be happening in an autopsy like this. So the biggest thing is I'm, I'm looking for cause of death. Um, so I'm going to look at the body. Um, I might have a story as to how someone comes in and how the story fits with what I'm seeing on the body. Um, sometimes the story would be someone shot themselves and I do the examination and I think that that doesn't really fit the story. So there needs to be further investigation. Um, if the story was that this person was shot by someone else, I want to make sure that it's not you know, a contact gunshot wound was going to be more consistent with someone shooting themselves or possibly no one considered that information. Um, so we want to see that the story fits what we're looking at. And were you told anything about when the, when the body comes in and you're asked to do an autopsy, were you told anything about the story in this case? Um, I don't remember specifically the exact information that I received, but I would have had some information, yes. Do you remember it being inconsistent with your findings, the story being inconsistent with your findings? No. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Let me talk to counsel for brief. Oh, she's a second. It's not over yet, so it doesn't look like there's enough time for them to cross-examine today, right? So we're going to have to start with them well, later this afternoon, which will be the next time. On the injury, it. doctor, if I may, Your Honor. On the gunshot, the injury and the damage to this person, um, how impactful is this on a victim? ability to survive it or the length of time to survive an injury that you saw? So there's injury to the major artery, right? The aorta, um, which is the, the vessel that carries oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself, to the brain, to the muscles, 
to all the vital organs um, that right, right after it comes out of the heart. And there's a, a large laceration tear through that artery. So oxygenated blood isn't going to be reaching where it needs to reach. Um, it's just going to be collecting outside of the normally closed system. Um, so life can be sustained until the reserve is gone, which is, you know, a cardiac cycle or so. Um, or um, an injury like this can be fatal pretty quickly. I wouldn't call it instantaneously lethal. Typically, when we think of instantaneous instantaneous death, it involves the brainstem. So the respiratory and cardiac centers are all within the brainstem. If we have a gunshot wound that goes through a brainstem, it's considered pretty instantaneously incapacitative death occurring. Um, here, it's going to be pretty quick because it's the very large artery that is injured, injured and the blood isn't going to be going where it's supposed to be going. Um, maybe function retained for a few minutes. It's really hard to know. There's so many variables that go into each person. Um, the underlying state of health, what the person was doing prior, um, so many different things that play into that and really no way of, of studying um, multiple people getting multiple gunshot wounds and this type of injury. Um, so an estimate would be you know, a few seconds to a few minutes few seconds to a few minutes? Correct. Can an individual, in a, in a few minutes, can an individual continue walking like normal or running like normal for a few minutes, or is it death within a few minutes? You understand the difference between the two? I do. Um, and both of those are, are plausible, possible. Are they... On that, on the, the, the distance and the, the time of death, it depends upon the victim, right? Correct. And there's no way of knowing about, would there be a blood trail? Would this kind of injury cause a blood trail? Potentially. Um, there are two defects from which blood could leave the body, right? There's an entrance wound and an exit wound. Um, so if the blood was leaking out of either of those wounds and the person was moving, there could be blood on the ground or the, he was clothed. So it could just be being absorbed by the clothing. Um, many things that I don't have an answer to. I don't know. But he could, the, the, the victim could have been stopped in his tracks and collapsed also. Yes. Could the victim, can the victim talk with this type of injury? Potentially. That's all you're on. Thank you. Let me talk to counsel, Denise. It looks like he's still going to ask more questions because he's still standing up. Oh, no. Everybody's standing up there. The jury's leaving. Then they're going to talk to counsel. Well, it's time for lunch. Who's hungry? <laughs> Just good. Healthy appetites. All right. Um, we're breaking a little early. Another judge has scheduled a hearing at 1 o'clock, and it requires the court reporter. So we're, we're going to break a little bit early to give the court reporter a little extra time for rest. But we will recommence uh, at 1.30. Please be in the jury room at that time. I'll excuse the jury, uh, and I'll stay here with counsel. Have a good lunch.
You can leave your things there. How do you think she feels about her right now? Now, props to her. She kept her cool um, when when she started. See, now for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to keep my cool because I know what I know. So you know, if I would have if I would have seen that many gunshot wounds, um, even if someone had told me a thousand times. This is a rifle. I would I would know what a rifle gunshot wound looks like. I would, even if I don't know calibers of weapons and and all of that. Um, if you see a a thousand rifle gunshot wounds, you know what a rifle gunshot wound looks like. If you see handgun, even far away, close, you 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 know what they look like. She knows what she knows. Um, I wish she would have. I wish she would have stood up for herself a little bit more on the stand and explained in more detail how she knows what she knows, that she knows what she knows. The record will show the absence of the jury. Um, is it Ms. Tim or Kim? Doctor. Doctor, I'm sorry. Thank you. Doctor, was it Tim? I, it was Tim? Tim? Okay. okay. Uh, you're excused for lunch if you'd be back at uh, 1 30 to continue with your examination. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Your Honor, I'm speaking with counsel, cognizant that one counsel is not from Arizona, but we're trying to schedule a walkthrough or a, um, a preliminary walkthrough with counsel, with attorneys. And we're hoping Walk through of what the, the, the scene, the, uh, or, the scene. And we're hoping if the court's amenable to it, that the attorneys get together to go to the defendant's residence tomorrow morning. We start at 1030 with the jury, but gives us an opportunity to go see the scene, report back and figure out, and then gives us an opportunity then to address the court and talk about what's agreed and what's in conflict. And so we're hoping to see if we can, start court tomorrow at 10 30 because councils and us are going to be busy working going to scene to look at the scene your honor i'm aware of this conversation and i know it's up to the court on the timing of this um defense has seen it but we are prepared to go out and allow the state to look at it prior to the actual jurors going out so we have no argument with that and um, we were just trying to figure out the timing and it was suggested by the state to do it at that time. If the court would agree, we would agree. Isn't there any other time? I mean, I, re I really hate to uh, use up trial time for that, um, especially since we talked about this before trial. I suggest to the parties that they do this before trial so we don't take up trial time. Uh, isn't there any other time when you can do this so that we don't use? Yeah. Today. Time that we'd otherwise use for trial. Right after we, could, we could do this weekend. I was just being courteous to counsel, who is who had weekend plans. I was trying to be courteous to this. I thought scheduling. I thought you were here for the duration, right? Oh, I'm not going out of state. I just have family in different parts of Arizona, and I thought nothing was happening this weekend, and arranged for my time to be in Phoenix, since we have three day weekend. I didn't realize that was going to be cut into. So I, I also three, suggested we leave three day weekend. Well. You no, don't have no. court on Mondays, oh, so it makes it a three-day weekend for me. Uh, Since I'm in a hotel, I was scheduling something to do. Uh, I have another alternative suggestion that we leave it for, and we go directly from court out there. It's my other thought process, um, allowing the state to see it. I like that better because it allows us to recess early. The, the hours uh, between three and five are, you know, are usually when you know, people are a little tired and they're potentially less attentive than they are in the morning. So we could, uh, when is it getting dark? Like 6.30? About 6.30? Yeah. Does that work? That was yes. for the state. Yes, for us too. Your Honor, as long as it's not today, we do have two witnesses today who have scheduling issues. So we just don't want to 
tomorrow. run into a scheduling issue today. Uh, you, you, all you folks work it out. I think that's a better suggestion just because it's, it's a better time of day. Um, and the jury is never disappointed about being Good excused job, a little Judge. early. Good job. So let's try and work on that. All right. Okay. Perfect. We can discuss it when we come back after lunch. Very good. We're in recess for lunch. We'll be back at 1.30. We made it. We made it through day 6 a.m. I'm half tempted to just name it day 5 p.m. just so people don't go looking for it. <laughs> because I know they're going to. But you know what? They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Guys, thank you so much for coming out to watch this. Um, I'll get more up pretty soon. I hope you guys have a great day. Bye.